You're listening to Paris' State of Mind on Paris Underground Radio. Welcome to Paris, a state of mind. Join us as we talk about the good, the bad, the ins, the outs of property rentals and purchases in and around Paris. We'll have topics for renters, owners, and visitors, share questions we are regularly asked, and more. My name is Gail Boisclair of Perfectly Paris, and my co-host is Marie Pistinier of Lokim Paris Be a Part of It. Both of us are proud members of the SPLM, the first representative body of furnished rental professionals. Hi, Marie. How are you? We're back in our podcasting studios again. Hi, Gail. I'm very fine. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm great. And uh, I'm excited about our podcast today because we're going to go on with our special guest, part two of our conversation with Adrian Lee about fractional ownership. Adrian, how are you? Doing wonderful. It's great to be back. Thank you, Gail and Marie. It's a pleasure to be uh, talking about one of my favorite subjects. <laughs> well, yeah, it's very interesting. We we found so many interesting things in the previous episode and how you can purchase something on a lower investment. I think, Marie, you've got some really, really important questions that you can ask Adrian. Yes, because I'm, I'm used to do a regular sales. So I, I was, and I don't know, I, I learned a lot of that fractional ownership since a uh, since few time now, thanks to Adrian. Uh, my first question would be like, how do you give the value of the, of the share? Because you have the value of the property, but uh, do you take the value? Do you make an, uh, an estimation, a quotation, and then you divide that by the number of, uh, of share you are going to sell? I wish it were that simple, um, but it's not. So first of all, when you develop a fractional ownership property, there are an awful lot of additional costs that you wouldn't have otherwise. You know, you have to transfer the property into a specific kind of structure. And in the past, we have used an SCI, which is a Société Civile Immobilière, French property company, that would then be owned by two U.S. corporations, and you have to create these corporations on the U.S. side. But we have uh, been given advice to simplify that, so our latest properties are no longer purchased in the name of an SCI, and they're purchased only via one U.S. corporation. But that has to be dealt with, and you have to do all the legal work, which is not inexpensive, And we work with a lawyer who is a specialist on fractional ownership properties in the United States to develop all the paperwork, which is extensive and complicated, like anyone (laughs) might imagine. Um, And then in order to make the property perfect, they usually require quite a lot of renovation and decoration, and that's expensive. So you have an awful lot of costs that you might not normally have with a standard uh, individually owned piece of property. Uh, then we're entitled to make some money. So a profit is built in just like with anything. And then it's divided up. Now, when you divide that up, then we kind of look at what the other share values on the market are. And we actually look at it on a per square meter basis, just like you would any property you purchase. So we have our own range of per square meter value that we use to price the uh, shares. So this will be included in the price per square meters will include all the costs you just mentioned? Yes, but it, it's the way we actually create a, a share price. Now, I have a particular method of pricing the shares so that they increase in price as they're sold out. So the first four shares are at the lowest price. The middle five shares are at an average price, and the last four shares are at the highest price. And it's sort of like the way art is additioned. And that's, of course, designed to jumpstart the sales, for one thing. And because as they're sold out, the people who bought in early immediately already have an appreciation on their shares. So it actually works very well. What's interesting, though, is we have found that on the last several properties that we've launched, we will sell out the first nine shares within literally minutes. Amazing. (laughs) It seems like I post the newsletter and within three hours, I've got nine shares sold, done. 
And then the last few shares, which are the most expensive, might take a month to three months longer to complete. So that that's just been kind of the MO. You know, it's it's how we've seen this happen. It's interesting, though. So I would have a question like uh, on the real estate uh, agent portion, like, uh, so you sell it at two different times, the, the, the share. So how do you, because when you found the property, then it's someone who sells it and then you think that it could be a good, a good product for your clients. So at what point people are going to pay? Is it like everyone is paying at one time when they sign the final, the final moment? Or is there like an in-between moment where the property is not fully sold, but partially sold? No, the developer, okay, in this case, I'm the developer, right? I actually purchased the property. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, when you purchase property, there's um, a clause de substitution between the signing of the pre-sale agreement and the final act of vente. So normally I'll sign the the promesse de vente or compromis de vente in my name only, then the American structure is put in place and it's the deed is in the name of the U.S. corporation. Okay. Okay, now let me tell you how complicated this is, okay? <laughs> Because if you know about owning real estate in France when you buy it, the money has to come from the account of the person who's buying it Yeah. for money laundering reasons. It can't just come from anywhere right? So we have to set up U.S. bank accounts in the name of the U.S. corporation, move money into that before it moves to the notaire, just in order to manage this transaction. Now, once the developer or the, you know, the U.S. corporation owns the shares, then the shares are sold on the U.S. side and nothing changes on the French side, nothing. It's in place. So this is the key to making this work. And so the final signature, it's the, the U.S. corporation who will, uh, who will make the final signature. Right. And the representative of the U.S. corporation. And it's almost always me because I'm the developer. Okay. A little question that, um, uh, that I have. When you, when you give the price, uh, you include, of course, the renovation and, of course, the architect and all the, 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 the design that you are going to, to put in that. This is planned to be right after the signature. So there is after a timeline between the time that the property actually belongs to the corporation to the time that it's uh, actually um, done and renovated and... Um, Yes, but we can sell the shares in advance of the property being actually closed. The sale of the shares is in the U.S. corporation. Okay, so remember that we're selling the shares in the U.S. corp. So the property doesn't even have to yet be owned by the U.S. corporation in order for us to sell the shares. This is a clever thing. And it doesn't have to, well, it's, very, it's a very clever thing because very often we actually have the money before we purchased the property. Speaking about the money, how do we how do you go for to purchase a, I heard that you cannot get a loan or mortgage on the for, for this kind of ownership? No, that's right. At least in in France? No. No, 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 because you're not buying a property in France. You're buying shares in a US corporation, so a mortgage cannot be obtained. For someone who wants to borrow the money, they can maybe take a line of credit based on their US assets, but that's up to them. But the shares are not usually so expensive that it warrants taking a loan. I mean, if someone needs to buy, needs to take a loan to buy a share, then they shouldn't be doing this. Mm -hmm. Quite honestly, if they can't just write a check for it, then they probably shouldn't be making this kind of an investment. They're never going to lose their money. I've never sold a share for less than it was paid for. Never. Everyone always makes a profit on it. Uh, so the true cost of ownership really only ends up in the operational expenses, right? Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, they haven't rented anything while they were in France, so they've saved on the rental. Yeah. So the bottom line is it's a money-making proposition, but that's not the reason to do it. The reason to do it is that you have this little pied de terre, you know, your, your little foothold in France that you can just enjoy as your own. It's emotional. It's not about the money. It is. It is emotional. You're right. Yeah. It's your own pied-à-terre in, in, in a different way, in, an, in a very uh, North American way. And 
I like the idea that you are sharing it with other people. And, uh, and I totally agree with you saying that if a person can't afford to write a check for it, then they shouldn't do it. It's kind of like a person that says, uh, yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna book EasyJet or Ryanair to go on holiday. I'm going to roll my clothes up so small so I don't have to check anything in. And uh, then when I get to my vacation place, I'm just going to, you know, eat out maybe once a day. It's like, wow, <laughs> is that a holiday? That's not a holiday. That's prison. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, yeah. If you can't afford to do it, then you probably shouldn't. Well, there are just better ways, you know, for you to make investments or save your money. And um, because I like to think of it, you know, Mm -hmm. from the global perspective and we're consultants, Uh, we're not interested in our pocketbooks. We're our goal is to help our clients make the best investments they can make. That's the whole point. And uh, so there is a bigger picture here. But, you know, for under a hundred, let's for under a hundred thousand euros. What are you going to buy in Paris for under a hundred thousand? Nothing. Nothing. There's nothing in this market that is under a parking space. No, you can buy a parking <laughs> space for that, can't or you? Two, yes, you can buy a parking space. You know, you need for a studio, you need three hundred thousand, mm-hmm. right? So, what's the point of buying a studio for three hundred thousand that you're only going to use maybe four weeks a year, and then can't do anything with, other than the appreciation of it? Mm-hmm. Right. So instead of spending 300,000, maybe your share is 60 or 70,000 and you have your four weeks in something luxurious that you don't even have to worry about taking the care, taking care of because you've got 12 other owners who are going to help you do that. Mm -hmm. So it's hassle free. And so, so after you have the the 13 owners, uh, then the, the renovation is done and everything. And then uh, how do we do we do? We mentioned that a little bit in our previous episode, but uh, how do they do to manage the tax foncières, the tax d'habitation and everything? Is it, uh, can they do that on, on their own, like with a, like an internal association? No, we set up a manager, just like you have for rentals, a concierge who manages all those details on behalf of the owner. So we have a manager who makes sure that everything is paid that all the maintenance is taken care of, that the housekeeper comes in, all of it. It's all done. Um, and a bank account is set up so that the dues go into a, their bank account, then it gets paid, right, to the various utility companies, et cetera. And it's all managed by one person who is paid for by the association, via the dues. And so every regular, at a regular level, you do send to all the owners uh, the bill. <laughs> so, okay, we do have that in that. Yeah, once a year, once a year, they get a dues bill. Just like you get on your building. You know, if you own the property in Paris, you're going to, from your copropriété, you're going to get the quarterly, right, bills, right? And so in this case, we only do it once a year and they send their money in and we keep track of it all. And then we uh, basically review the, the past budget, look at the adjustments we need to make for the future budget. And it's all managed by this one person who's been designated as the manager. That's great. And can any of the owners, let's say they have a question or something, I imagine they can then just contact their uh, property manager, essentially, because that's what she she is. She, exactly. She or he, pardon me. That was very nice. <laughs> yeah. And they're there. Yeah. No, 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 exactly. Yeah. It's, it's actually very simple and as hassle-free as it gets. And they don't have to think too hard um, and just have fun. Mm-hmm. Come in with suitcases, you know, unpack, have a good time. Some of the properties are large enough that they have uh, owner closets. Mm-hmm. Uh, for each and every one? For if we have the luxury of that. Yes, wow. so that you can actually leave some of your things there. But others are too small to do that. So it just depends. Okay. Does everybody get their own owner closet? So 13? <laughs> of course. <laughs> That's nice. Of course. We don't want anyone fighting over owner closet space. <laughs> no, no, not if we can help it. No. <laughs> Fortunately, we've been lucky. We haven't had uh, any owner fights that I know of. <laughs> if you're enjoying this episode of Paris, a state of mind, you may also be interested in our sister podcast. Don't miss this. Join Jennifer weekly for the scoop on what's happening in Paris. 
Paris A State of Mind. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now back to Paris A State of Mind. Well, it sounds like it's a really great way, truly. I don't know. Do you have any more questions, Marie, on the on the purchase aspect? Not on the purchase, but uh, in the the well run. Then on on the on the sale, like okay, you you love France and you have been you have your little uh, little uh, pied à terre in Paris, uh, and then at a certain point you have other plans, other project. How do you how do you leave the the project? Even though you've made good friends with the twelve other owners, how do you sell your share? Is it easy to do so? Okay, so let me yeah, let me just explain one thing there, and that is that you're not there at the same time as the other owners. So you may never meet them. Okay, but they do like to introduce themselves so that they get to know because they're part of this group. So it's kind of like this little community, and we set up a Facebook group that enables them to post messages, ask, you know, when they want to trade a share, they can use that. They post photos, restaurant suggestions, you know, anything that might come up. Nice. And so they have their own little community, so to speak, right? Um, But they might not ever actually meet or get to know one another because they're not there at the same time. And when they want to to sell your their share, I guess that usually they do suggest it to the other of the group, probably. Well, by the bylaws. The bylaws require that they offer their share. Now, these are our bylaws that we developed. Everybody can have their own set of bylaws, right? These are the rules that we've made up. So within the bylaws, you must offer your share to the other owners first before you put it on the open market. And then when you put it on the open market, you can sell it however you want. We do offer the service of marketing it. We have very good success in selling the shares. And um, as I said, I've certainly never sold a share for less than it was paid for, never. And you will have to do the another quotation, like another estimate. So is it more complicated? Well, yeah, we, have, we evaluate the current value of the share. We evaluate what that what that is and then market it at that price. And then there are, is some legal work to do to transfer the shares. And the attorney handles that. Okay, I guess. And usually the buyer covers that expense. As, as it will go through the U.S. corporation, if I well understood, does this mean that you don't have any plus-value to pay? That's right. If you do, it's on the U.S. side, not on the French side. Right. Remember, the French side never changes. Yeah, because it's all in the U.S. So, and if, um, for example, unfortunately, one of your, the owner dies, can his uh, heirs uh, inherit from, uh, from them, even though they may not match the group that you have set up? Well, c'est la vie, okay? They, <laughs> they do inherit. They inherit the share just like they would inherit anything else. And they can do whatever they want with it. They can use it. They can sell it. They can. It's just like anything else. It's like a piece of jewelry or, or the family china. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's actually pretty simple. It is yeah. actually. As you as you've explained it, it's a lot simpler than what I envisioned in my head. Well, it's simple on one level, but the development of it, I can tell you, is complicated. <laughs> and that's mostly because of the French side. Mm-hmm. Not because of the U.S. side. That's because. No, because we love paperwork. <laughs> That's what I was going to say, Marie. You beat me to the punchline. We love paperwork. Well, you're not. Hey, the French aren't happy if it's not complicated, okay? They they really. No, that's true. They, they, it, it needs to be an intellectual, you know, exercise. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> It's like we don't do Scrabble or Sudoku. We, we prefer to do uh, like uh, completely edit the paperwork. So another uh, almost <laughs> last question. Um, so let's say I'm French and I want to buy a fractional ownership. Is it like impossible? Well, it's not impossible, <laughs> but it's unlikely. I mean, <laughs> because it's just not your style. You know, okay. I mean, we're talking about buildings. With... I will try to t- do not take it personally. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not. No, I, I don't mean, this, this, is, this is fact. This is not opinion. Okay. <laughs> we all know that 
the idea of neighbors in this country in a building is not the same as in the U.S. You know, you don't move into a property and everybody comes with their sugar or their apple pie or whatever to say hello, welcome to the building. That doesn't happen. Okay, so <laughs> it's it's a it's really a cultural thing that Americans are open to this idea of sharing. And what about if if people are just willing to do fractional ownership, but not to live in the in the premises, not to come for vacation, but just for investment? Like, okay, it's a little bit of stone. Instead of buying a studio that I cannot purchase myself, I have a, a piece of stone that will the value will raise along the along the years thanks to the the market. Well, part of the bylaws says that you can't rent your property because the owners don't really want outsiders in the building. They really want owners in the building. And it doesn't make sense to do solely as an investment. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, it just doesn't. I mean, you might as well enjoy it or, you know, let your friends use it. You can do that, your friends and relatives. Right. That's a good point that you mentioned. Yeah. 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 That was one of the questions. So, and you can, you can lead, let them uh, use it for free. Yeah, you can you can absolutely let your friends and relatives use your property, but we we do not allow rentals. So mm -hmm. you're not supposed to make money out of it. Yeah, no, I was I was more thinking like someone who say, okay, I will leave it empty, and but it will the value will increase um, along the year. Like if you have like a hundred and twenty thousand uh, thousand euro, you know, like to. Yeah, but there's still better ways to do that. <laughs> okay, you know, I mean. I can I can give them lots of other better ways to invest their money. They might as well invest it in a way that they're going to get pleasure out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, that's what makes the most sense. It's interesting that it has not taken off in Paris sooner than now, fractional ownership. Well, no, it did. There was a wave before 2008 where there were several properties that were developed. Like I said, I was working with a lawyer who was doing several. Um, and then 2008 hit and yeah. everybody's money went away. They didn't have that extra little chunk to put into anything. So it took the last, you know, 10 years for them to uh, gain their wealth. And now with the rental laws, particularly in Paris, mm -hmm. uh, that has really encouraged this now. So, you know, what we're doing is making hay while the sun is shining because we believe that this is here and now. I don't think this is limitless. I think there is a certain limit to it. I don't, it's not for everyone. I don't really know how big the market is. I will tell you though, that I have three properties right now that in two in Paris that are both totally sold out that had a January one usage started January. I have one in Villefranche-sur-Mer that is more than half sold out. And I think the reason it hasn't totally sold is because we really haven't had any real photos to show. It's still in the final stages of renovation. So it's down to the wire. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm about to launch another one in Paris, a small one, a one bedroom, a 30 square meter, one bedroom, also in the Marais. And I'm going to launch a two bedroom apartment in Nice both with July, starting in July usage dates. Nice. And I'm not at all worried about the sale of those because we already have a very long list of potential, you know, buyers mm -hmm. that are just waiting for us to announce it. Yeah. And to, and to know if they are going to be selected, you know, like it's like the, the Oscar and yeah. the, it's like, I want to win the prize. And the nominated to own the, the, the share of the Nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's tricky. Um, we operate on a first come first serve basis. So when we put out an email that says, do you want to be on our mailing list? We create a special mailing list so that when we announce the property, we announce it to that mailing list first. Then whoever answers first gets first dibs, but we wait until it is a reasonable hour on the West coast <laughs> so that we don't give East Coast an advantage. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> well, I mean, we have to think of all these things, yeah. you know? Um, but we also know who has written us a million times to say, I want my share, I want my share, I want my share. So that we do, you know, we have to favor some of that interest. So, you know, it is a, it's, it's a human <laughs> 
<laughs> element coupled with the idea of first come, first serve. I'm glad you're selecting and not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I mean, we, you know, we know because we're getting the emails from people and you, and when they get really uh, excited, like, oh my God, have you put it up for sale yet? Do you, are you sure? I want my, I want my sale for sure. I want, you know, and they, they write us every few days to be sure. Mm -hmm. So we know we have a buyer. So we favor those people, of course. Why not? Yeah, no, you're right. You know, if you own a restaurant, you favor the people who patronize you every day, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. <laughs> that yeah. works. Yeah. Even with me, with my rentals, I will, you know, I've got people that come back to the same apartment every single year. And I will favor a blocking of those dates, even if they haven't said that they're coming, but I know that they usually come then. If I get a request for their date to their apartment, then I will usually reach out via email saying, oh, right. can you confirm? don't know if you're planning on coming. Yeah, exactly. Because but... <laughs> you don't want to give it away. Yeah, because... Even though it's not fractional ownership, it is their apartment and their time. It's preferred customer. Yep. This is, yeah, of course. We all know how this works. Great. Thank you very much for sharing on that. Well, of course. I mean, and with the price differences, you know, we have to try to be as fair as possible. So occasionally, if one person, if one buyer pulls out and it means that the next one well, goes to a lower price, Oh, then we have something great to tell them. Guess what? You've just moved up in the rank and the share is going to cost you a little less, you know, and then they're, then we've made them really happy. Yeah, definitely. Great. Nice. Well, it sounds like win-win. It's win-win for everyone. It, it is. So far, that's what we've seen. Mm -hmm. And of course, it, again, it really depends on the, the property has to be perfect. Perfect. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can see that. And you, like you said in the first episode, it has to be universally perfect. It has to tick the majority of people's boxes and then some. If you're enjoying this episode of Paris, A State of Mind, you may also be interested in our sister podcast, The Terroir Podcast. Join Caroline and Emily as they take you through the ins and outs of France's regional riches. Paris, a state of mind. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. So in a couple of cases, I actually went to owners who were originally renting their properties and couldn't rent them anymore, knowing that they were such good properties. And I made this proposal to them to fractionalize it mm. because I knew that that would be a great property. So if you go on the site, on our website, and you click on Les Balcons Saint-Paul, for example, um, that's a gorgeous piece of property. And the owner, when they couldn't do the rentals, wanted to sell. And when we did the math, selling just didn't make sense because they had invested so much in it, in the renovation of it. But it made a lot more sense to fractionalize it. They didn't care about keeping a share. Interesting. Now, in other cases, they would want to keep a share or two. So that happens also. But, you know, it's all about, you know, like that, and that property, okay, it's a 69 square meter, two bedroom apartment in a Hausmannian building on the corner of Rue Malaire and Bois de Cecile with a gorgeous view of St. Paul from a wraparound balcony on the fifth floor. Nice. <laughs> South facing. Okay. Perfect. It, Yes, exactly. It, you know, it's perfect. Okay. It's beautiful. And then we went in and we spent a ton of money renovating it again to the nines with all custom built everything so that it would be even more than perfect. And it has two chambres de bonne up one level up that make owner's closets. So it really was like the ideal situation. And it's now just sold out. I can imagine. It sounds beyond perfect. Yes, exceptional. Well, when you see it, you go on to it. Martine did it. Martine Di Matteo did the reno. Um, and it's her gorgeous taste. Uh, and it's just perfect. It's delightful. Well, I'm definitely going to check it out uh, as soon as we get off our podcast recording. 
And speaking of which, why don't you uh, leave your details verbally with everyone and we'll also put them in the show notes too. Okay, well, it's pretty easy. Um, the website is adrianleads.com and that's A D R I A N L E E D S. You know, Adrian spelled like a guy. That's me. <laughs> what can I say? Um, there is a section for property sales, and under it is a, a menu item for fractional ownership. And then there's another link that clicks on uh, the properties that are available. So they're all there. It's very easy. They can also email us at info at adrianleads.com and ask any questions they want to ask. Uh, and uh, that's the easiest way to go. And subscribe to our newsletters. We, I write, I don't know if you guys know this, but I write three newsletters a week. I know. Have been doing this since 1998, believe it or not. One of them is called French Property Insider. It's every Thursday, and it's specifically about properties. The other two are Monday and Wednesday, and um, these are all, this is all information I you know write about. And so there's a lot of resources there, the archives. We're working on getting all the archives up on our new site. And um, But you can always subscribe and get information on a regular basis. And, and if you get tired of hearing from me, unsubscribe. <laughs> <laughs> Who could get tired? You're a wealth of information and you're so entertaining. Well, thank you both so much. This has been an awful lot of fun. And, We've loved it. Well, and it's great. I think what you guys are doing is fantastic. Paris Underground, we've needed this for a long time, and it's so good for everybody out there for, to have all the information you provide. So I want to thank you. Aw, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Adrian. And if we don't speak before, uh, have a great trip back to the U.S., and hopefully we'll catch up in person when you come back to Paris. Yes, and just know that when people ask, do you live in the States part-time? I go, no, I'm only going <laughs> No, I've been here 27 years and I'm not going anywhere. Uh, it's just to visit my daughter, get a breath of fresh air for, well, fresh, <laughs> in, <laughs> whatever you can get at the moment. Um, and then I'll be back in February. Great. Perfect. So see well, you very thank soon. You again. Thank you again for the time and for all the explanation. It, uh, I think uh, we, we have had like new perspective on the, um, on the real estate market in France, I'm sure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you again. Bye, all. Take care. Bye. Take care. Thanks for listening to Paris, a state of mind featuring Gail of Perfectly Paris and Marie of Lokim, both who are founding members of the SPLM. Paris, a state of mind is produced by Paris Underground Radio. The music Jazz in Paris is by Media Right Productions. For more information on this show and others, go to Paris undergroundradio.com. This episode of Paris' State of Mind was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more on this show and shows like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com.